Hey, before we get into the Word, I'd like to tell you a quick story that I think illustrates what's going on in our times. Here in Australia, here in my city, there's a you know, fairly popular born-again Christian school, so it's supposed to be Protestant Bible-believing. And one of our friend of a friend went to do a, a teacher interview for a job over there, and you know, they didn't ask him anything about his teaching experience. You know what was the question that they, they asked him? They wanted to know, what's your opinion of Trump? And right away, that's you know, a dead giveaway that they're anti-Trump. And it just makes me think, what, what would, first of all, what would make a Christian school ask that kind of question? It shouldn't even be ethical to be you know, sorting people out on a political spectrum. They should just be a good teacher, they should love teaching, they should love the students and the subject. But this is now the litmus test. The church is, you know, I just think on one end of the spectrum, I think the church has actually been infiltrated. It's been infiltrated by people who know exactly what they're doing. They're undermining the Word of God. And you can see that in the Catholic Church. You've got a Pope that just, you know, hours ago decided to say, breaking his Catholic tradition, to say that he supports same-sex marriage. Now, I'm not a Catholic, so my question is, how can you even be a Catholic? You know, it, by your tradition, by your canons, by your history, uh, how are you a Catholic and support same-sex marriage, right? It's just, it goes against all of their own traditions and history and what they stand for. And how many nuns and how many organizations, you know, are standing up for traditional uh, family and, and you know, they're anti-abortion, pro-life. So you can just see someone like that uh, always espousing climate change, communism, socialism, and then it's no surprise that he's now come out with that. I'm not against Catholics. I know a lot of you watching me are Catholic, and I know lots of wonderful Catholics, uh, including in, in the hierarchy, including the priests. Um, many of them are, are good and born again. But on the one hand, we've got infiltrators in both the Catholic and the Protestant Church. And on the other hand, we've just got people who are completely Bible illiterate. They're basically following the crowd. They're following whatever the media tells them. And so if the media is anti-Trump, which obviously it is. There's hardly uh, any mainstream media that is not anti-Trump. So they get spoon-fed that information and then they believe it. So what's the antidote? I guess right now, you know, the antidote is to read Trump's unfinished business or President Trump's pro-Christian accomplishments. That's all I can say. I mean, there's not much out there, and we researched, we researched it. It's a lot of facts. It's a lot of scriptures, and you'll see for yourself. You can think for yourself. You can decide for yourself. So I want to commend that to you, and um, I just want to let you know that actually Trump's uh, pro-Christian accomplishments, we now have just come out with a second edition, and I think you'll like that because we listened to you, and we did a couple of things. First of all, we added five more facts, so 220 pages became 230. Um, we've changed the font. So some people said that they like a more read readable font, and I think it is now. And we just slightly improved the cover. It's going to be a, a more glossy cover and just slight changes so that it's more readable. Anyway, that's the second edition of this book. And again, I thought this book would just last up to the election. But you can see, I mean, that's the question that Christian schools are asking of their teachers. They haven't read this book. They don't understand the information. They're either not Christian or they are Christian that simply believe the media. They need to get a hold of something like this. In fact, they should study this in a Christian school. And for classes on civics, politics, history, uh, even biblical studies, they should study Trump's unfinished business, 10 prophecies to save America. Because these are the principles of justice, social justice, and governance. And it's a thick book. You can go through this um, in a class on civics or politics and you know, take a whole year just to go through this. And it's got climate change in there, which I think a lot of the Christian schools uh, either are you know, teaching just like the world and not really examining the facts, um, or they just need more good resources all right, to bring a balance to the subject. All right? Bring a balance. There's, there are different sides and perspective to the subject. So it's not just whatever the media says is right. So, let's get into the Word of God today. Doesn't it feel like we live in an age where everything is out of order? You know, another word for order in the Bible is honor. Everything's out of whack because people don't understand honor anymore. 
So we're going to continue today and talk about a subject that we have been covering for many weeks, the subject of honor. We said to you, honor is everything. You know, if you learn all the laws of God, like the Pharisees did, but you don't know who to honor, you don't know when to honor, you're going to end up like them. They weren't qualified to rule and reign with Christ, and instead, fishermen were, tax collectors were, even former prostitutes, because they honored the right person at the right time. They ended up having the authority, and they were included in God's great plan. So we got to learn to honor, like David did, like Jesus Christ did. It will affect our eternity. We talked about how honor is connected to gratitude. You know, the world doesn't honor God because it's not thankful to God. It doesn't know what God has done for them. And so they dishonor God. Many people, even in the church, they begin to lose honor because they lose gratitude. So important to check our gratitude level. Sometimes we think, well, we made it ourselves. No, somebody prayed for you. Somebody counseled you. Somebody helped you when you were down and out. And now you're up and you're strong. Don't forget to be grateful. Otherwise, it would be very easy to fall into dishonor. Honor is connected to mental health. Boy, that was a good session, wasn't it? We just took this one scripture, Romans chapter 1, verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's a terrible thing, to have a darkened heart. Do you ever feel that? Like a darkness is trying to come upon your heart or upon your mind? Yeah, it's like a mental illness that people have. But without Christ, they continue to walk in that. But for us, all we have to do is just begin to worship. Begin to think about, what am I grateful for? What has God done for me? What has the church done for me? What have other people done for me? And that cloud will begin to lift away. Because the Bible says when you're not thankful and when you don't honor your mind becomes futile, and then this darkness comes over people's soul. You can't solve that just with drugs. You have to learn honor, and honor belongs to certain people that God has appointed over you. We talked about how you cannot honor yourself. A lot of people, when they learn honor, then they begin to demand honor. You must honor me, and you make a mistake doing that. You know, when a parent says, well, the Bible says that a kid's to honor me, therefore I demand honor. Well, you don't understand the difference between compliance, obedience, and honor. Compliance is, you know, I do it because I have to, but I don't want to. But you force me. That's compliance, and a lot of parents get that. But that's not honor. It's not honor, it's also not love. Then you have obedience. It's that I do it because I have to, and I decide I want to. I obey. And that's another level. But honor is I do something I don't have to do. The three mighty men getting water for David. Just because he mused. Just because he said he was thirsty. And he said, oh, I wish I could have the water from the well of Bethlehem. Then they fought through the enemy line. And they went to get that water. And David said, wow, this is so holy, so honorable. This kind of honor is not something that I'm worthy of. I need to pour out this water and honor God. Boy, that's when you do something you don't have to do, you begin to enter the realm of honor. Honor occurs only when you do something you don't have to do. So until you go beyond what is expected of you, you've not entered the realm of honor. Until you do more than the least that you have to do, then you are not yet a person of honor. So important. Choice is very important. Honor is a choice. We talked about that. And today, we're going to talk about something new. We're going to talk today about six relationships of honor. Yep, God has appointed certain people over us. And we begin to draw out their gift. We get the best of them when we honor them. It's just an amazing thing, a great principle. Now, every generation, people honor someone above God. It's just a flaw in, in humanity. And so we've had 6,000 years of living this life out, and every generation seems to pick something that they want to honor more than God. Finally, in the last millennium, when Jesus returns, I think we're going to get it right. But right now, as 
students of the word, as Bereans, we want to understand honor and we want to be doing it the way that God wants us to do. So there are, as I count it, six relationships of honor. And like I said, there's always someone that people put above God. Let's go to Malachi chapter 1. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, the Lord says, A son naturally honors his father, and a slave respects his master. If I am your father, where is my honor? If I am your master, where is my respect? The Lord who rules over all asked you of this, you priests who make light of my name, but you reply, how have we made light of your name? That's in the New English Translation. So you can see in the ancient time, people knew to respect parents. Boy, for ages and ages, people just understood that. And God says, see, you respect your parents. When are you going to respect me? Then he also said, you honor your master. Today we would say your boss, your employer. You honor your employer. You honor your secular boss. Well, where's the honor for me? God was comparing. Then in the mid, uh, Middle Ages or in the medieval time, that honor shifted towards the priests. And so they could do no wrong. People just thought, I have to give this unconditional obedience to, at that time, the Catholic hierarchy. And so that became grossly abused where they honored the religious leaders so much that they forgot to honor God. They would honor the edicts of the Pope more than the word of the Lord himself. They would read the papal bulls, they were called. These were orders of the Roman Catholic Church, and they forgot to read the Bible. So again, like I said, every generation makes a mistake of honoring someone they are supposed to honor, but honoring them above God himself. And so we get these 6,000 years to go through in order to play out every scenario until we are fully satisfied. Everyone knows, you know what? It doesn't work unless we put God number one. He's really got to be first. So in the medieval ages, people honored the priests too much, uh, very blindly. And then there was a backlash. Then there was a reaction to that. And they said, oh, now who are we going to honor? Because we can't trust the religious hierarchy that came out of Rome. Who are we going to trust? Then they put their trust so much in the kings. And the kings began to revolt against the Catholic Church. And so they were deemed to be the heroes. And then I think we're still suffering it today, that backlash, where people, even Christians, believe we are to honor civil authority even above God himself. But that's the, the age we live in. It uh, seems so strange. So who should we honor? Let's go through these six relationships of honor. It means that there's uh, an order to this. There's protocols. And if we do it right, then we will tap in and release the gift that will benefit us inside of that person that we honor. So we definitely want to be people of honor. If we don't honor people who God sent to us, then what we're going to do is we're going to end up dishonoring them. We're going to end up missing out on benefiting from the gift that's inside. And you know what we do? We resort to our own wisdom. We resort, we tap into our own ability. We should say inability because no one can live by themselves. And so dishonor does so much damage to our lives, it really skews our spiritual perception. So number one, who should we honor? Without a doubt, there is a relationship between the Creator and the created, right? The Creator and the created. This is the relationship between God and man. In Romans chapter 1, we read this, verse 21, They know God, but they do not give Him the honor that belongs to Him, nor do they thank him. That's the good news. The English standard says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. All right, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, a man of God said to Eli, therefore the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now declares the Lord, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. The main way that we honor God is by my relationship to his word and to his spirit. We have to have time 
in the Word of God. That's honoring the Word of God. I don't have to read the Bible, right? No one's going to put a gun to my head. The pastor's not going to call you up every single day. I don't have to do it. But when I make the choice to do what I don't have to do, I begin to become a person of honor. I enter into this supernatural realm that unleashes, that releases the great blessings of God contained in the Word. How do I tap into it? How do I get the healing out of it? How do I get the blessing? I must honor the Word of God. Then, honor is also expressed, my honor of God is expressed by my relationship to the Holy Spirit who's in me. Do I acknowledge Him when I wake up? Do I say, good morning, Holy Spirit? Do I say, Holy Spirit, help lead me throughout this day? I offer my life to you. I know that you know everything. Please guide me. I begin to acknowledge Him. I begin to look for His leadership, even if I don't feel like it. Sometimes people are looking for a feeling. They say, but I don't feel Him. You know, when I first got saved, I felt this warmth. I felt this, you know, great embrace, like, he, like He's a daddy that hugged me all the time, and now I don't feel like it. What, what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. You're growing up. You're not walking by feelings anymore. You're walking by faith. And until the feelings dissipate, you're not really using your faith. You're just walking by feeling, which is a very immature stage of Christianity.